Well, welcome, welcome, welcome to today's slightly delayed live conversation about flood legends from around the world. My name is Eric Hoven. I'm the president of Creation Today. And Creation Today really exists to try to take uh, people's stumbling blocks, the things that are keeping them from Christ, and turning them into stepping stones and allowing them to realize that they really can have the truth and that truth really can set them free. Hey, if you're joining me from uh, one of our social media platforms, thank you so much. Uh, we're excited to have you on here. I got a few questions. I threw out a questionnaire on Instagram and I got a few questions from that. People were asking, actually, I can't see that. Can you go to those questions so I can see that? People were asking, hey, is Atlantis Lost City, could that be a pre-flood legend? I wanna to try to get to that later today. Had another one, can you explain how the Grand Canyon was formed? Yes. Yes, as a matter of fact, I can, and the flood had a part of it. Matter of fact, if you don't want to wait for the answer, GrandCanyonMovie.com, GrandCanyonMovie.com, full explanation right there. Does Genesis 3, this is interesting, does Genesis 3 refer to man's soon-to-be average lifespan on earth? The answer, I believe yes, but we can talk more about that later. Got another one, what was, did I have one more from Instagram or no? I got several. Oh, oh that was it. Do you suppose that the ice... Uh, at the caps could be the water from the flood. Actually, as you get into the flood, this is about legends of the flood, so it's not specifically about t that today's conversation, but you actually find out that the flood is what triggered the ice age. We had hundreds of years of a real legitimate ice age. There weren't many of them. There weren't you know millions of years ago or hundreds of thousands of years ago. It was after the flood, about 4,400 years ago, that the ice age happened. But search creation.org if you want to get more information about that. Hey. We'll try to get to those questions, but first let me show uh, or say a little shout out to our partners. Thank you, thank you, thank you to all of our Creation Today partners that help make this happen. Lester in Alabama, little shout out to you. Thanks for hanging out with us. Doug in Washington, thank you so much for being part of Creation Today. Julie in Columbia, we love letting your hands and feet reach around the world through the work of Creation Today. So. Thank you guys. Hey, I got a giveaway. I want to give somebody this ebook. Okay, I know this is the book, but I want to send you the ebook version of this. It's called Echoes of Error Rats. It's at the Creation Today store, and it's got over 300 legends of floods from around the world. The very conversation that we're going to be talking about, this goes through over 300 of them. It's an amazing, amazing resource that'll help equip you. Now, I realize that we got a lot of people joining us on YouTube or Facebook that you're skeptical. You don't believe the flood really happened. And I just want you to know that you are evidence. You are evidence that the Bible is true. The Bible tells us that in the last days, scoffers are going to come. People that make fun of the Bible are going to come. And here's what they're going to say. The scoffers are going to say, there wasn't a creation. There wasn't a flood, the very thing we're talking about now. And there's not going to be a coming judgment of God. You are evidence that God's word is true. It was written over 2000 years ago. And we are going to have a great conversation. And I pray that this information that we share is able to pierce through your blindness and allow you to understand and see the glorious light of the truth of creation, the truth of the flood, and what you need to do about the coming judgment that is going to face us all one day. My guest today is an incredible guy. Uh, his name is Jeremy Wiles. He uh, has an amazing ministry. We actually met, I don't even remember how many years ago. It had to be over a decade ago. Somebody had scheduled me to do a radio interview so I jumped on this radio interview and uh, they said, hey, we're going to have another guest on there. He knows a little bit about the ark. And it was this guy, Jeremy Wiles. He starts talking about his experiences going to different countries where he filmed their legends of the flood and was capturing these. And I thought, this dude is amazing. So after the show, I called the radio uh, host. I said, who was this guy? I got to get a hold of him. He put us in touch. And ever since then, it's just been really, really incredible. A few years later, uh, Jeremy called me and said, hey, I'm doing a new series. I want you to be a part of it. And sorry, that's all my notifications going on. My, my bad. Uh, I wanted me to be a part of it. It's called the Conquer Series. Jeremy, 
You're a legend, dude. Oh, You're come amazing. On, man. Get out of here. No, <laughs> I mean we need mu- We should have had music for Jeremy when he came on. This you, oh, you're like yeah, we need right. some kind of legendary music behind you, dude. Seriously, you and your Thanks, wife sir. Tiana ha- are pioneering new things. You've done some amazing things already. Just the Conquer series that you did, and I want you to tell people about it real quick. The Conquer series that you did has reached over a million men to help them understand the trappings, uh, the addiction yeah. uh, of sexual addiction to pornography and help them become free. That was an amazing, by the way, just welcome. Welcome. Thanks for joining. Thanks a lot, I really Eric. Appreciate it. It's good to see you again. Thanks for having me here. Love your show. Your Conquer yeah, series you know, is phenomenal. Pornography is an epidemic in the church. It's an epidemic in the world. And so we thought, well, we should probably try to do something about that and and you helped us put that together you were in it and it's called around the world it it was a blessing to be a part of that series and actually uh just get to share my story and i'll tell you what guys if you're stuck if you're stuck there is a cure and you need to go check out just google conquer series or go right to the website which is is it conquer series or the conquer series just conquer series.com conquer series.com man amazing and uh, their new platform. Uh, let me let me save that your new platform. Hang on just a second. After Congress series, Jeremy was the director of photography for Genesis Paradise Lost, the uh, the movie that we produced uh, that was in over twelve hundred theaters. And Jeremy, it's already been translated into over thirty languages, dude. I'm blown oh away. Gosh. Genesis wow. Paradise Lost. It's still going around the world. We just finished our release in Latin America. It just got done going through Latin America. Uh, wow. If you haven't seen that, genesismovie.com, amazing. Uh, and it was uh, it was just a really cool experience to be there filming together. I'd never worked that hard filming all night long in a museum. It was literally night at the museum with you. Too cool, man. <laughs> you, you got any good memories from that? No, that was, uh, that was a horrible experience. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it was definitely. indeed very stressful. Worked- we worked like 72 hours straight, didn't we? It oh, it was, it was nuts. I love it though, man. If I'm, if I'm behind a camera or working around on a film set, it's just, it's perfect for me. I loved it. Such I did life. not know for those, we are getting to the flood legends, but just let me tell you guys, I did not know what it took to set up lighting in an environment. It's like, we got permission to use the museum. I'm like, all right, cool. We're good to go. We go in there. And they're like, yeah, we're going to need three to four hours just to set up the lighting. Jeremy, I had no clue what was coming, man. Yeah. No clue. Yeah, we had a skeleton crew um, with, I think, like three moves in a day. So we had, to, we had to set up the lights, tear them down, and set them back up, and tear them down, and set them back up, and tear them down. So that was, that was a long day. And that was from <laughs> 6 p.m. till 10 a.m. That was our working schedule. And then during the rest of that, that's in the, in this, anyway, just crazy. I remember, I remember we, uh, we kind of, we kind of vandalized the museum a little bit, didn't we? That was you. That was you I, that well, did that. <laughs> okay. We do have a little bit of evidence of me vandalizing the museum. You might have to go to PowerPoint and click play on that if it's not going, bud. Or is it going? Oh, I remember this. Check this out. Okay. Hey, yeah. yeah. Jeremy wants to get in on the action. Jeremy. Oh, oh no! Jeremy's t- vandalizing the Creation uh, Museum right there. Uh, uh, I hope I hope Ken Ham's not watching this right He's, now. So yeah, I hope I'm gonna get an invoice. <laughs> <laughs> so I I guess I did kind of start that one. I did I did kind of jump in there. What we needed is a really cool shot with a fossil in the background. So we needed this uh, particular particular shot. Um, are you, are you finding that? Yeah. So we had to move these guys out of the way, and uh, and have this really cool fossil in the background. Wait, what? Oh, oh. <laughs> 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 like ten grand. Too much fun, man. So I, I've never been on a shoot. That was my first shoot. So for me, it was a beautiful, crazy thing. I just thought that's the way they all went, man. I thought it was awesome. That was at like 3.30 in the morning we were doing that. It was. I think I fell so, asleep on the museum floor one night. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Since then, though, you and your wife, Tiana, have pioneered a new platform called Soul Refiner that is allowing people to find love and freedom in the arms of Jesus Christ 
through beautiful, beautiful, uh, well-orchestrated productions. Can you can you tell them about that? And then we got to get to we we got to. I want to jump on. Yeah. Jump so on the slow Soul Refiner is essentially a, a platform that allows people to to deal with the the junk and the trash in their life. And often uh, we don't realize how much baggage we're carrying in life until we get to a place where uh, we start to feel a lot of pain, uh, whether that's addiction or a broken marriage or divorce. And so our goal is to help churches, uh, basically to enable churches to help those people before that happens and after that happens. And often, it ha you know, we, we, we're there after it happens, unfortunately, but um, we're there to help broken people, set the captives free. Well, I love the fact that your new platform not only helps churches, but small groups can sign up for it, individuals can sign up for it, and they can be instructed right there. They can. Some of you are in the middle of brokenness, and you need Soul Refiner. Others of you, you think you got it made? Please, I'm telling you, put put some education in your life ahead of time so that those kind of things don't happen to you because they do come unexpectedly. Well, Jeremy, I, I got to tell you, man, when I heard that you had traveled to more than 40 countries investigating and learning about the flood, the worldwide flood, I was, I was kind of shocked. I was like, you're serious about figuring out what went on here. Like, how did that get started? What, what launched you on? I'm telling you, you, you are just the man's man. It's incredible. Oh, what what on, launched man. you on this you know, journey? Eric, it was really this passion because I was in my early 20s. I was wound up. I wanted to see the world. Um, and I set off on this adventure to Eastern Turkey. And that was it. It started with a backpack and a cheap camera. And so I, I, I convinced a small team of scientists that I found out who were doing research at a site in Turkey that could possibly be Noah's Ark. So I, I contacted them and I convinced them that I was a professional filmmaker. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, on the flight to Istanbul, I'm learning how to use the camera. And <laughs> oh my word, that was it. So I got there, you know, it was this thirst for adventure and to travel and see the world. And uh, I showed up and I, I started filming this this documentary and the idea was you know, I'm gonna go in there and shoot this thing I'll, I'll figure out how to make it work and I'll get back home and I'll figure out, out how to edit and I'm gonna turn this into a documentary and then I got back home and it was so horrible the footage was so bad <laughs> and, and so I, I, I shelved it and then the next year I went back and I went back again and I started going to these other countries and the the quality of of what I was capturing was getting a little bit better, but it was still bad. The whole thing was bad, and uh, <laughs> that's, that's what I was doing. I just, but I never wanted it to end. I was so I was having so much fun, and uh, I was traveling with this guy from India and this other guy from Holland, um, and uh, we were like, yeah, we don't care if this ever gets made. We're just having a blast documenting what we're finding and the experiences and the memories and yeah. so what's interesting is when i when i was coming back home i was trying to learn how to be a filmmaker and so i had to figure out um, the basics of using a camera and cinematography and editing and i i got hired to make videos for nursing homes and so I'm, I'm going into these nursing homes filming promotional videos of these old folks. And uh, I'm using the money from that to travel the world and to search for Noah's Ark and flood story. So it was like, you know, polar opposites. You know, back home, I was, I was spending my time with 90-year-olds in nursing homes. <laughs> and out here, I'm traveling. And, uh. you, the, I picture... Uh, uh, I'm trying Indiana Jones. That's who I think of when I think of you, uh, because you're you're really <laughs> going out. So what I want in this conversation is I want to I want to unpackage some of these stories that you heard firsthand, because uh, you're 
you're literally going to these places where you've heard have a legend of the flood and, and you're, you're finding out what that legend is from the people actually telling the legend. Yeah. You got to, I mean, we got this book, Echoes of Ararat. There's, there's a lot of different resources out there that show some of these things. Um, fact that there really was a worldwide flood, you know, John Morris's The Global Flood. Uh, flood of Noah is another one, Legends and Lore. So there's all kinds of wow. stuff out there that says, hey, the evidence is in, the flood really happened. But to me, one of the, other than God's word, one of the greatest things we have is the fact that people have been telling stories about this for centuries. That's right. So I'm ready for story time, buddy. <laughs> you know, the, the many... The, the, these flood myths all around the world are just retellings of, of a real event. And it's been distorted through centuries of passing down information. Um, so if, if a worldwide flood never happened, then why are there so many stories about it? <laughs> right? And what most people don't realize is that there's 300 and something flood stories, global flood stories around the world and the majority of those stories, we're talking like over 80% have similarities. And those similar, similarities are, it, um, most of the stories mention a boat. Most of the stories mention animals on the ark, that God was judging the world uh, because of the crimes of, of, of man. Uh, it talks about a rainbow. Um, so you have to look at that and say, well, if, if this was just by chance that there are that many stories around the world about a flood, then why are all the stories quite similar? And so it's, it's, ex, it's exactly what you'd expect to find if there was a real event, a global flood. You'd expect to find stories all around the world. <laughs> and so you got the stories. It's there. The evidence matches what God's word has already said. By the way, if you've never read it, it's Genesis chapter six through really, you know, six, seven, eight, nine. It's all right there about the great flood. Genesis chapter seven, God said, come into the ark. And uh, by the time you get up to chapter 10, Noah is having his descendants and they're repopulating the world. Um, I, side note, just for a second, I've done studies on human population. Anybody can study the growth of human population and the human population growth shows that the entire world, about 8 billion right now, I know they're trying to lower that, but it's another story, about 8 billion, um, we came from a, a couple of people about 4,400 years ago. The, the, the exponential growth curve in the human population matches what this says and what it teaches us in the Bible. So, well, I, I got 300 here, but instead of me reading uh, the ones that I've got right here, uh, which are fascinating, and I cannot pronounce most of these people's names in these other languages. Um, but uh, tell us firsthand some of your experiences. Where, where all did you go? Um, well, I, you know, there was a, there's a lot of flood stories out there, and I knew I was never going to document them all. Um, what I've always wondered is, you know, what happens over the next generation or two when, when these people start who are living in tribes, these indigenous regions in the world, they start to assimilate with normal population and they lose those stories. And I thought, man, it would be incredible just to go in to these areas and document these stories before they disappear. Um, and so that's part of what I was trying to do, but I knew that you know, one guy traveling the world to document 300 stories plus is, was not gonna happen. Um, but I went through India and China and the Philippines and a lot of other countries to capture these flood stories. And, um, you know, just off the top of my head, the, the story in, in, uh, in India was fascinating because they each have their own flavor of, of a real event. And it's, it's, uh, it's normal that uh, if you pass down a story through many thousands of years, it's eventually going to get distorted. And so as you go into each of these countries and, and read a, about their account of a worldwide flood, there are differences, obviously, but most of the stories have a common theme. 
like I mentioned before, a boat, animals on a boat, um, and a worldwide flood. And so when I went into, into China, um, there's quite a few flood stories in China. And one of the Chinese legends explains that the flood was caused by an argument between a crab and a bird. Yeah. And so some of these stories get really crazy. Um, and then this character, Fuhi, who was the, the, uh, the hero of the flood, Noah, and his wife and three sons and three daughters escaped a great flood and were the only people alive on the earth. And so it's kind of like, okay, well, that's, that sounds a lot like the Genesis account. Um, as I was leaving to go to China, I was, this is a, a strange uh, incident that I had. And I was, I, was, I was going to bed late at night. It was around three o'clock in the morning. I had just finished packing all my camera gear. This sounds crazy to some of some of the people out there, I'm sure, but um, I was packing all my camera gear. I was going to bed late at night. It's around 3 a.m. I had to catch a flight to Beijing the next day. And I didn't really know where I was going to go in China, except I was going to land in Beijing, meet up with an American missionary, and we'd start to, to you know, contact professors and and put together a plan. And so I hopped in bed, I'm exhausted, I work like 15, 16 hours. And as I'm trying to go to sleep, I've got this phrase in my head. I, this sounds weird, but it's the honest truth. Um, I, I had this phrase in my head, which was, why do roosters crow in the middle of the night? I just kept saying this to myself, why do roosters crow in the middle of the night? I thought I was going crazy, or maybe I was just totally exhausted from working that day. And um, I thought, well, okay, eventually, I fell asleep and um, went to Beijing the next day. And, you know, God has a peculiar way of speaking to us sometimes. And it's not always how we think he speaks to us. And so as I landed in China, met up with this, uh, this American missionary who was our translator and my good buddy Ashish was with me. He was my cameraman from India. And um, we met up with the most prominent historian within a week or two of being there in China. And he explained that they had found what are called oracle bones. Um, I guess it was like back in the early 1900s. And these oracle bones were dinosaur fossils that the ancient Chinese, uh, 2200 BC, I believe, so we're talking like 4,000 plus years ago, had carved their, their, uh, their ancient language into these dinosaur fossils. And they actually called them dragon bones. I think that's where the terms dragons come from. Um, so they carved these, uh, the development of their calligraphy into these, these bones. And, and so he, as he's explaining this to me, we're talking through the development of their of their um, of their ancient Chinese language, um, and so I'm asking him, um, you know, who are, who else can I speak to? Who else has information on that? And we're passing, we're kind of like piecing this thing together as we go. And I met up with this other guy, and he he goes in depth on the ancient Chinese language and how it how it came about, essentially, which is they took their history and events in the past, and they embedded that history into the development of their calligraphy. And so the Chinese writing is actually pictographic. It uses ideograms, which are symbols, and several symbols may make up one word. And so I asked him to give me an example of this, and he said, um, he gave me the word for big boat. And he said, it's, there's three symbols here. It's vessel, eight, and mouth. So when the ancient Chinese referred to a big boat, they referred to eight people in an ark. Wow. Yeah. And it's literally wow, recorded right? right there in their language. It's right there in their language 4,000 years ago. Man, you, you're, you're making me want to get right to why would somebody deny this 
evidence of why I would say. So when they, when they share their legend, actually, I've got a clip of you in China talking to a Chinese man. Can, can we show that one real quick? Check this out. You're sitting there. Okay. What's going on there when you're sitting there talking to him, asking him about flood legends? Tell me, tell me about what's going on right there. Man, that brings back so many memories. <laughs> <laughs> Looked like a kid. Um, he was actually singing the story of the, of the global flood to me. He was one of six men left in, in his tribe um, that knew the story of creation and the flood. And so I asked him, I said, well, why did God destroy the world with a flood? And he said, well, he looked down on the earth and he saw that there were two brothers and one brother was jealous of the other brother and he killed him. So that sounds like Cain and Abel, right? So it does. Um, yeah. And, and so God saw this crime, he saw this murder, and he, de he decided to destroy the world with a great flood. And then he said that the, the world grew cold and the plants would not grow. So they had to call upon the roosters to get the sun to come back up. Maybe it's just a coincidence, yeah. Eric, but I had this crazy thing in my head, which was why do roosters crow in the middle of the night? And I had no idea that that was their story in China. And so, yeah, maybe, maybe I was just, I had too much chocolate before I went to bed. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. But you go to China and you find out their ancient legend says that's why, that's how the sun came back up. Yep. So it sounds like they say Cain and Abel, wickedness on the earth, flood after this cold, we would say ice age, rooster yes. crows, sun comes back up, brings the warmth again. You can see how their legend fits a biblical narrative of what actually was going on exactly yeah it's 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 not perfect their stories are are convoluted and a little confusing at sometimes um but you know it's kind of like that game that you play as a kid chinese whispers when you whisper something into the <laughs> kid's ear sitting beside you and it goes around the room and you're like i didn't say that <laughs> that's that's how the flood stories exist today that's that's how they sound they sound like chinese whispers um, but we know it's all of these stories are based on a real event that took place. And, and so this guy that was explaining these characters to me, he, he showed me the, the word for brother. And he said, um, when you put this mark right here, and he was drawing this for me, he was painting it actually. He said, you put this little slash right here. He said, that's a sickle, like a garden sickle. And then if you put an X on the brother's forehead, this word changes from brother to murder. No, no way. way. I was like, I just met with this old guy in this Hmong tribe who told me that God flooded the world because there were two brothers fighting and one brother killed the other. And you know, they, he, he hadn't even put that together. Wow. Yeah. Um, hey, I... Let me pause for just a minute, Jeremy. I want you to go into a couple more stories, but before you do, uh, I want to give away this book. Uh, hey, if you're on our one of our social media platforms, thank you for hanging out with us. I know we got a lot of you guys on there right now between the YouTube and all the Facebook accounts. Um, I'm going to give this away actually to one of our creation partners. So this would be somebody that uh, is actually gone to creationtoday.org and is a partner of us. So uh, those of you joining me live at the Creation Today Partnership, Thank you guys. I know we had to reschedule this, so I appreciate you being able to jump back on here real quick. Um, uh, let's see here. Uh, I'm just going to pick any, meeny, scroll through them here. Any, meeny, miny. You know what? Masaki, I'm going to hook you up. Masaki, I'm going to send you this book. Marlis is going to send this to you because uh, this is incredible. You're a guy that's uh, young and studying this information and wanting to use it to go out there and share it with others. So, Marlissa, if you'd hook up Masaki with a copy of Echoes of Ararat, that would be absolutely awesome. Uh, for the rest of you out there on social media, come on over to creationtoday.org and you can hear the rest of the story if you'd like to do that. 
I'd love to have you join me for the rest of the story. Uh, appreciate that. We'll say goodbye to you guys for now. Next week, though, for those of you on social media, uh, what, oh, we're going into part two of aliens and UFOs. It is going to be a great conversation. I've got an F-18 fighter pilot, Jason Pratt, and then a creation, a creation dude named Ian Juby. Uh, I call him the crazy creationist, and I think that's a fitting term. Crazy creationist Ian Juby is joining me. So if you uh, if you want to join me next week, as long as we got internet and we got power at noon next week on Wednesday, we'll be going live so you guys can join us then. If you want to hear the rest of the story, come on over to creationtoday.org. All right, Jeremy.